2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Who's the he and what's his time? The he might be revealed in his time. He is the man of sin, the son of perdition. His time, the time of Jacob's trouble. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. How we know that he might be revealed because he just talked about the man of sin, the son of perdition, setting himself up, eventually setting himself up as God to be worshipped in the temple. Okay? This happens in the time of Jacob's trouble. So, the, his time, when does the man of sin, the son of perdition, get revealed? The time of Jacob's trouble. Where do we get that title? Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that, it, that none is like it. None is like it. It's the worst time period in history. It's also the hardest time period in history to get saved. And we've been, we've been talking about this, you know, lest God shorten those days, no flesh should be saved. He has to seal 144,000 Jews in their forehead so they don't take the mark and they don't worship the beast. There is none like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. So we get that title, Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. Who's the he? The Jews. God goes back to dealing with the Jews. Today is the time of the Gentiles. And I'll go through it real quick. The time of the Gentiles today, when I say that, I'm not saying only Gentiles can get saved. The Pauline epistles, John, Peter, James. Right? This book is written by Jews. Okay? There were saved Jews. Okay? There's some saved Jews today. There are brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? What it means to say the time when Paul... When, Jesus says the time of the Gentiles, and then Paul says the time of the Gentiles be come in or be fulfilled. He's saying that salvation went out to the world. When Jesus was in his earthly ministries preaching, repent and be baptized for, for the remission of sins, water baptism, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the king, gospel of the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, Jesus goes around and says, we know what's, what we believe in for salvation is of the Jews. Jesus told his disciples not to go the way of the Gentiles. Salvation is of the Jews. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day, salvation went out to the world. That's why it's called the time of the Gentiles. Not because only Gentiles can get saved, but that salvation went out to the world now. In the time of Jacob's trouble, God reigns it back in to the point where he's focusing primarily on the Jewish people in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why it's called Jacob. Jacob is another name for Israel. God told Jacob, your name is no longer Jacob, but Israel. So it's saying Israel's trouble. The he shall be saved out of it is there's going to be some, a lot of Jews that get saved. Not a lot, a lot, but at least 144,000. Okay. Verse 8. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck. His yoke? Who's the his? That he might, uh, he might be real, revealed in his time. The man of sin, the son of perdition. He's going to break his yoke off of thy neck. And will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. Now I'm getting my head of myself, but it talks about sending a strong delusion that he's, he's basically most of the world is going to be worshiping him and following him and in bondage to him. He's going to set up. He's going to have a hand in setting up the third temple, and he's going to be controlling the Jewish people. And God's going to break them off the neck and they're going to run to the wilderness and they're going to have to hide out in the wilderness for times and times and half a times, I think it is. Okay. That's what he's talking about here. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king whom I will raise up unto them. Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh to be their king. They rejected him. But Jesus is coming back at the day of the Lord at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble and he's going to be their king again. He's going to sit up and he's going to rule and reign for 
uh, with a rod of iron. And he's going to reign for a thousand years. Okay. Let's keep going. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 7. Or, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. We're going to get into that. And only he who now let will let till he be taken out of the way. There's a big controversy on that part too. We'll get into that too. So let's get into the first part. Mystery of iniquity doth already work. What's that talking about? Well, brothers and sisters of Christ, God's already preparing the world for the time of Jacob's trouble today. Well, how's he doing that? Turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children... It is the last time, and as you have heard, that that Antichrist shall come. Forgive me, brothers and Christ. I had to turn on some heaters this morning. It's getting hot now. <laughs> that, that that Antichrist shall come. Now, once again, brothers and Christ, I was corrected by a brother. I didn't know any better, and I went with the correction, because I'm trying not to be above correction, that that man of sin, the son of perdition, he's never called an Antichrist. Well, anytime it says man of sin, son of perdition, you're right. He's never called an antichrist. But he's called an antichrist right there. And as ye have heard that that antichrist shall come. What did we just read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? The man of sin, the son of perdition. Okay. He's going to come. And we just read the mystery of iniquity doth already work. He's being, the, his way for him to come is being prepared today. And, and John says, and ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. He's talking about the man of sin, the son of perdition. He is called an Antichrist. Even now, even now, there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. The last time. The world is being prepared today for the day, uh, for the time of Jacob's trouble. That Antichrist spirit is building in the world. Remember what Paul said? If anybody preach another gospel, which we have not preached, or get you to receive another Jesus that we haven't, we haven't preached, told you about, or get you to receive another spirit, which we have not received. I received the Holy Ghost. But there are a lot of people out there that have a profession of faith. they got an Antichrist spirit. They're worshiping a false Christ, an Antichrist that spirit's already in the world today. It's building. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Okay. Now we get to this part. This is where some of the brethren are getting confused. Only he who will now let, letteth, will let until he be taken out of the way. What's that saying? It's saying that the body of Christ has to be caught up for the man of sin to be revealed. And people get all kind of upset and say, wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait. Did it just say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, that the day of Christ, that uh, in verse 3 it says, right here, verse 3, it says, Let no man deceive you, right here, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Wait a second, is this a contradiction? First, it says the man of sin has to be revealed so the body of Christ can get caught up. Now we get down here to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, and it says, He who now let will let till he be taken out of the way. Who is that? That's the body of Christ. Now it's saying the body of Christ has to be caught up before the man of sin is revealed. Well, which is it? Both. Now, before we get into this, God put it on my heart to, to say, Do you guys remember in the Old Testament... There was a big controversy on uh, Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was this old before he began to reign, and then Jehoiakim was this age when he began to reign. It had two different ages for him to begin to reign. And there's three types of people, brother says Christ, that look at that. You have the person who's not a Bible believer, the lost world. And he looks at it and goes, ah, see, it's got mistakes, it's got errors, and he throws it in the garbage. Then you've got the servant of Satan. Okay? You've got the second group of people that look at it. They look at it and go, ah, oh, it doesn't make sense. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to mess with the book so that it makes sense to me. I'm going to use man's wisdom to mess with God's word. And okay, now it reads much clearer. Then you have the third set, Bible believers. 
They look at it and go, Lord, what does the Bible tell us to do, brother, sister, Christ? It says, if any of you lack wisdom, what are we supposed to do? We're to ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. Lord, it says it here, an age here, and it says an age here, a different age here. I don't get it, Lord, but I believe this is perfect. Your word is perfect. This isn't perfect. This is having a hard time understanding this because this isn't perfect. Lord, can you open the scriptures to me? And I've got videos on here talking about the answer to that question. But let's get back to this one. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, or verse 3 it says, verse 2 it says that the, as the day of Christ is at hand. Now we've pr proven that the day of Christ is the catching away of the body of Christ. It's a title for the catching away of the body of Christ. Christ. Why do you think it's called the day of Christ? I want to be doing some more like small videos with questions that brethren have had in this study. But it's called the day of Christ because we are in Christ Jesus today. If any man be in Christ, not in the Lord, in Christ, he's a new creature. We're the body of Christ. Right? We are sealed. If you're in Christ Jesus, you are sealed unto the day, day of redemption. What's the day of Christ? The day that the body of Christ gets redemption. We get fully redeemed. We get to go home. I trust the Word of God. It says day of Christ. Day of Christ is always a reference to the catching away of the body of Christ. Then we get down here and it says, wait a minute, first it said that in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Christ, the catching up, shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed. We see the falling away. We're waiting for the man of sin to be revealed, the son of perdition. Then you get to what we just read there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 7. For the mystery of iniquity all doth already work. Only he who now let will let till he be taken out of the way. Which is it? I already gave the answer. Both. I prayed on this and said, Lord, it does. It does look like it's a contradiction, Lord, but I trust your word. I don't want to change your word. You know what some brethren have done? They've done that second part. They didn't do the first part because they, lo they do love the word of God. But they're so quick to say, I have to defend the word of God, and I've got to wrestle the scriptures to my own destruction, and I've got to make God's word make sense instead of asking God to show me the truth I've got to take it upon myself to jump the gun. And you know what they've done? Where it says in verse 2, where it says, Day of Christ is at hand, they try to change and make it that is talking about the catching away. Day of Christ is talking about the second coming, and is at hand, that's the catching away. What did they do? They took Day of Christ, and they in their head, because they don't want to be shown as a Bible corrector, outwardly being shown as a Bible corrector, in their head, they have taken a black mark, a white marker, whited out the word Christ, and they've written in the word the Lord. So it's no longer the day of Christ, but it's the day of the Lord, and they're trying to say it's the second coming. I'm not going to be that second person that tries to correct the Bible so then it makes sense. Correct, change the Bible so then, then something, so that I get it. And I feel like I saved God. God said it wrong, and I saved Him. And whew, boy, we just we had to do it. We just had to do it. No, we don't. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, why is it like that in the Bible? Is it a contradiction? No, it isn't. What? They both happen at the same time. I'll give you an example. Okay? We'll give you an example. The example of... Let no man deceive you by any means that that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man's sin be revealed. Do you believe that there's religions out there that teach that the catching away of the body of Christ has already happened? That 144,000 are actually Christian, I think it's Jehovah's Witnesses, Christians that were caught up, that 144,000 sealed, they're the Christians that were caught up and the day of the Lord happened spiritually, secretly and spiritually like you know, way back when. There's people that are coming and saying that the catching away of the body of Christ has already happened. How do we know that's a lie? Because you ask him, has the man of sin been revealed? The man of sin, the son of perdition, been revealed? There's a third temple that he's going to be setting himself up to be worshipped as God. Has any of that happened? 
No. They're liars. Why? Because the body of Christ cannot be caught up until the man of sin is revealed. I'll give you another example. Let's go down to what we just read there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. And he who now let will let till he be taken out of the way. Okay. What's this? What, what are they saying here? They're doing the opposite. You have people like the uh, post and mid tread people are telling you that the catching away of the body of Christ doesn't happen. The man of sin gets revealed and the body of Christ goes into it. That's a lie. Because the Bible says, he who now let will let till he be taken out of the way. If the body of Christ didn't go up, there is no man of sin, the son of perdition. Here's another example of that. How many of you, I've, I don't follow the news that much these days, but way back in the past, I, can, I don't think anybody lately, but there used to be a cult back in the past where you had some guy standing up saying, I'm Jesus Christ. And they had this huge occult following. Or small, small cult following, maybe a little bit larger cult following. I'm Jesus Christ. And people will look at him and go, that's the man of sin, the son of perdition. Is the body of Christ still here? Well, yeah, the body of Christ is still here, but that's the man of sin, the son of perdition. No, he's not. Why? Because we just read there, he who now let will let till he be taken out of the way. Brothers, says Christ, the best way that the Lord explained it to me, and I'm explaining it to you, they both happen at the same time. And what Paul's saying here is you can't have one without the other. Someone comes along and says, the catch away of the body of Christ has happened, you missed it. You ask him, where's the man of sin, the son of perdition? If someone comes along and says, hey, look, there's the man of sin, the son of perdition, where's the catching away of the body of Christ? Paul's saying it goes hand in hand. If one happens, the other happens. You can't have one without the other. And have we seen deception where people are saying, you have this one, but there's not this one. And someone says, you have this one, but there's not this one. In other words, both events, they can't prove both events happened, so they just say one of the events happened and try to deceive people. That's why it says, be not deceived. Okay? Verse 3, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, let no man deceive you. What's going on? You have people saying that one is happening without the other. And what Paul's saying here is you can't have one without the other. It's not a contradiction, brothers and sisters. I trust this book. It's perfect. You can't have the day of Christ without the man of sin being revealed. You can't have the man of sin being revealed without the day of Christ. You know what I believe sets both these events off that happen at the same time? Satan gets kicked out of heaven. And with his tail, he draws a third of the stars with them. When Satan gets kicked out of heaven, both these events happen. And I've been accused, well, you're trying to deceive people. No, the deception here is Paul saying you can't have one without the other. Anybody who comes to you and says you can have one without the other, they're lying to you. They're deceiving you. Oh, the church goes into the time of Jacob's trouble. That's a lie. The man of sin gets revealed at the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble, and we can't be here for that to happen. Some people say, oh, the catching away has already happened. They're liars. Why? Because the man of sin hasn't been revealed. The catching away cannot happen without the man of sin being revealed. Do you see how that works, brothers and Christ? It takes both events happening at the same time. One cannot happen without the other. And today there are so many lies, so many deceptions, where they're saying one happens without the other. And a lot of people are falling for it. A lot of people are falling for it, brothers and Christ. Turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. Brothers and Christ, once again, I keep throwing this at brethren on there. Are you looking for the blessed hope, or are you looking for the man of sin? Are you looking for that blessed hope? That's what we're supposed to be doing. Are there brethren that are looking for that man of sin? Yeah. Is the lost world trying to get your eyes on the man of sin? That antichrist spirit that's in the world today, getting you to look at the world and look, you're looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. You're not looking for that blessed hope. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I would have you not be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others do, which have no hope. But as Christ, we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. 
not the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, like I said, this body, Paul's saying you can't have one without the other. Absolutely. But are we supposed to be looking for the, time, for the man of sin to be uh, revealed? No. We're looking for the catching away of the body of Christ with the life that we're living. Sometimes, I always, I, I forget to say this sometimes, with that race analogy, Brothers of Christ, that we're running a race, and there's all these worldly booths beside us, and the, the trail goes this way, the, the path, the track that you're running on, it goes right, it goes left, it goes right, and it goes straight for a little bit, and it goes right, and you don't know if the, if the finish line is going to be around that next corner. One thing I always leave out is there's a clock. Believe it or not, there's a clock. The Bible says that God has given man a certain lifespan, 120 years. There's a clock. When you get saved, there's a clock. God's going to call you up into death one day, or He's going to call us up in life, the catching away of the body of Christ. One of those two is going to happen. There's a clock. You are now saved. You need to run that race as if one receiveth the prize. That's looking for that blessed hope. That we're going to go home to be with our Lord and Savior someday. Until that day happens, I need to get busy living for the Lord. But today, that's not popular. What's popular is looking for that man of sin. Looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. Looking for the mark of the beast. Looking for the one world order. Looking for the one world religion. That's what's popular. Others that have no hope. Before I was saved, brothers of Christ, I, had no, I was without hope and without God in the world. So were you. What's that hope that God gives us? That blessed hope. We're sealed into the day of redemption. The redemption. That day. The day of Christ. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of our Lord, that which we which are alive and remain unto the coming of our Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of our Lord. Not everybody is. We have a lot of brothers and sisters of Christ that are asleep right now that's talking about. All the way back to Paul. Paul was looking for that blessed hope. He believed the day of Christ was at hand. Anybody who doesn't believe the day of Christ is at hand is not a good steward of the scriptures. And they're not a good per they're not going to be exhorting the brethren properly. The day of Christ is at hand. Are you living for the Lord? You could go home to be with the Lord any day now. Are you, do you still have sanctification? Are you reading your Bible every day? Are you praying? It comes down to that, brothers and sisters Christ. Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Nobody's going to miss the catching away. I always have to keep saying this, brothers of Christ. Nobody's going to miss the catching away of the body of Christ, the day of Christ. Everyone gets to see it. The dead rise first are the first ones to get to see it. Then we which remain, we get our new bodies, then we get to go up with the dead in Christ. They get their new body first, they start going up, we get our new body, we start going up with them in the air. It says right here, Then Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I have this underlined, hardcore. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the blessed hope. Brothers and sisters, that's what we're supposed to be looking for. We're down here. We're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We have the ministry of reconciliation. We've got the Word of God. We've got our personal walk with the Lord that we've got to work on every day. Putting down the flesh, making sure we're separate from the world. Love not the world, neither things in the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You don't have to be a friend of the world. We've got to make sure we keep ourselves separate. We're in this world, but we're not of the world. We gotta work hard to stay separate from the world. We gotta work hard on our walk with the Lord. And we gotta work hard on that ministry of reconciliation and be an ambassador to the world. Ambassador for Jesus Christ to the world. I gotta say it right. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Brother Sister Christ, that's the whole point. That's what Paul is saying here. Okay? We're gonna be with the Lord. Don't worry, dude. And now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together to him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word. Don't be troubled. We get to go be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This time period, 
We're, I'm getting ahead of myself. This time period, there's a gospel in this time period where works gets added to it. There's no longer a seal. You're not sealed into the day of redemption. You have to endure to the end, and then shall you be saved. It's a different gospel. And we're going to get to a point here where Paul brings it back to the body of Christ and says, okay, but thanks be to God that our gospel, the gospel for today that God has given us, that we got saved today, we don't have to go through that time period and try to endure to the end to be saved. You can get saved today. That's, I said this before, brothers and Christ, that's one of our big motivators. It's supposed to be for this world. It is. You don't want to go into that time period. I believe, I honestly still believe that most of the Gentiles, since it goes back to being the time of the, uh, the uh, Jacob, the time of Jacob's trouble, and God goes back to dealing with Jacob, I believe most of the Gentiles, there's going to be a few, a small remnant that might make it through the time of Jacob's trouble, but predominantly most of the Gentiles who refuse to get saved God's way today and line up with this book, the King James Bible, God's perfect written word, all most of the Gentiles, when they go into that time period, that man of sin, they're gonna be they're gonna buy him hook, line, and sinker. Hook, line, and sinker. Verse 18. Remember what I said about the day of Christ. What is attributed to the day of Christ? Hope, redemption, comfort. Verse 18. Where uh, uh, First Thessalonians 4, chapter 4, verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What's attributed to the day of the Lord? Wrath. Judgment. Punishment. Fear. That's what is attributed to the day of the Lord. Fear. What's attributed to the day of Christ? Hope. Peace. Hope. Comfort. Paul has to keep warning them. Don't let people come in and deceive you. What are they deceiving them with? One day it happens without the other, and they try to deceive them into thinking they missed the catching away somehow. Either it already happened, or it's not going to happen, and you've got, and they give them fear mongering that you're going into the time of Jacob's trouble up to the day of the Lord, that the body of Christ goes through that. No, they don't. No, they don't. Okay? That's what's going on. And Paul's trying to ease their heart and comfort their heart again, saying, No, we're looking for that blessed hope. And we're going to go home to be with our Lord and Savior someday. You didn't miss the catching away. It could still happen any day now. The day of Christ is at hand. That's what at hand means. I had to give him a definition. There was a brother. At hand doesn't mean, because I said eminent. And he corrected me. It doesn't say eminent in the Bible. It says at hand. And I gave him the definition of at hand. We'll look it up real quick again. Um, I had to look up the word hand. And there's many definitions. But it meant any day now. It could happen any day now. There it is. Near in time, not distant. Near in time, not distant. It could happen any day now. That's what it means. They can't get away from that. So you have brethren that don't want to believe that the catching, catching away of the body of Christ, the day of Christ, could happen any day. Why? What usually distracts them? Respect of persons. The club that they're part of says it doesn't, so I have to say it because I'm of them. There's those types of people. But a big group of people that don't want to believe that the catching away of the body of Christ happens before the time of Jacob's trouble are those that are getting distracted down here. I've had brethren that turn their back on the day of Christ is at hand for the world. Because they're having too much fun down here. Their eyes are on the world. The flesh, the lust of the flesh, worldliness, idolatry. They love it down here. They have too much to lose down here. They don't want to go up anymore because they have too much to lose down here. Those are the people that are turning their backs on the day of Christ being at hand. 2 okay. Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. So we see there, once again, I explained it. The Bible's not an error. I'm not going to change the definition of day of Christ so that my little, little intellect can understand it. Trust the Lord and say, Lord, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. They give it to all men liberally and braideth not. Lord, I don't get it. Please show me. And what does God show me? They both happen at the same time. You can't have one without the other. If someone comes along and says, this one happened, and this one didn't happen, they're liars. 
If someone comes along and says this one happened and this one didn't happen, they're liars. They're complete and total liars. They're deceivers. That's what Paul is saying. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Once again, brothers and sisters, it's not a contradiction. The body of Christ has to leave for the man of sin to be revealed. The man of sin has to be revealed in order for the body of Christ to leave. Both have to happen at the same time. You can't have one without the other. And one doesn't set off the other. I remember some preachers trying to teach that. One sets off the other because when you say that, guess what? Now you've got that problem again. If one sets the other off, that means one happens before the other. One doesn't set the other off. The, like I said, I believe when Satan, the red dragon, is kicked out of heaven, that sets both of them off at the exact same time. You can't have one without the other. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with his spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Then shall that wicked one be revealed. Remember 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. It said, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin revealed, the son of perdition, that day. It's not a contradiction. Once again, you can't have one without the other. That's what Paul's saying. The easiest way not to be deceived, you can't have one without the other. First of all, remember simpleton? What are simpletons? By good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. If you don't know your Bible and you don't trust God, and you're not asking God to open this book to you, you're relying on some man behind the camera. You're relying on some man in a nice suit and tie behind a pulpit to do all the work for you. You can be easily deceived. You need to know this book. Okay? Man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Then shall that wicked be revealed. It takes both events happening at the same time. If you see one, you have to see the other. If you saw one and you didn't see the other, chances are you're being lied to. Okay? When we get caught up and that man of sin gets revealed, there's probably some people who don't see the catching up, the day of, the Lord, uh, the day of Christ. They don't see the day of Christ. They don't see the catching away of the body of Christ. But they, watch, they see that man of sin on the news and everything. He reveals himself. Well, if he reveals himself and that part is true, then you know the catching away of the body of Christ has happened. Some people see the catching away. You actually see the catching away of the body of Christ like we read it. All these people going up. It's going to be a huge sight for the world to see. Then you know the man of sin has been revealed. Why? Because they go hand in hand. If you have one without the other then it's false. It's fake. It's, they're trying to deceive you. Okay. Jeremiah 30, verse 8 says, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 8, For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke off thy neck. We're going to reread this because he'll break the yoke off thy neck. Who's? I will break his yoke. Who's his? That man of sin, the son of perdition, that wicked man that gets revealed. And there's going to come a day at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble called the day of the Lord where Jesus comes back and he breaks the yoke off. He throws Satan in the bottomless pit, the false prophet and the beast, he throws in the lake of fire. He breaks their yoke off their neck and will burst thy bonds and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But right now what we're reading is that he's going to be revealed. Now, the reason I say it, this verse right here, once again, it's gonna is this going to happen today? Why we, one of the things, reasons I'm going through this, Brother Jesus Christ, is because some brethren are saying all this whole passage, chapter 2, the whole thing is for us, but is it talking about this dispensation? No. It's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, and it's talking about this dispensation. You've got to rightly divide. The body, of way, the body of Christ has to be caught up first. That's this dispensation. Before the man of sin can be revealed, that's the dispensation of the time of Jacob's trouble. And the man of sin has to be revealed, the, time, the dispensation of the time of Jacob's trouble, before this dispensation can end and the body of Christ can go home. Okay. Once again, the Pauline epistles are 100% for us and about us. No, it isn't. That's a lie. It's not. 
The Lord shall consume them with the spirit of his mouth. We read in Jeremiah 38, where he talks about it. he's going to break the yoke off their necks. And it says that the Lord shall consume him with the spirit of his mouth. Turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 11. This is going to be a little bit longer. I could have just done the short verse. But I want to go over who God is, who Jesus Christ is. It's amazing, brothers of Christ. It's fearful. Revelation 1, 11, saying, I am an Alpha and Omega the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, and unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see that voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like, the, like unto the Son of, God, of Man. Now stop right there. It says, capital S, Son of Man. What is John saying here? He's saying... This is the king. Remember, when you have capitalist son of man, it's talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's the king. His bloodline goes back to King David. That's why his, on, on his mother's side, his bloodline goes back to King David. It's talking about Jesus as the king. That that land over there in Jerusalem belongs to the king. It belongs to Jesus Christ. It's his inheritance. It belongs to him. When you see capitalist Son of God, it's talking about the kingdom of God, that spiritual kingdom where Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, and only through Jesus Christ can we have that kingdom of God. Only through Jesus Christ can we get saved, have our sins washed away, be born again, and have, remember, it's uh, the ministry of reconciliation. Only can we be reconciled to God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, which is why He's called the capitalist Son of God. But when you see capitalist Son of Man, it's talking about his family line going back to King David where that land belongs to Jesus Christ. He's the rightful king. Clothed with garments down to the foot and girt about with paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool. White like wool. His hair is not wool. It doesn't have the texture of wool. It's white like wool. As white as snow. And his eyes were of the flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brasses as they burn in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. But this is Christ. When Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh, when God the Father came in the likeness of sinful flesh and was born of a virgin Mary, he came as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He came as a Lamb. A meek and lowly lamb. Obedient lamb. He's going to come back as a lion. And he's going to be making the rules. He's going to be laying down the law. He's going to be setting things right. He's going to come back like this. It's a fearful thing. I don't know if we'll get into it here, but... When, yeah, we will get to it here, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. Verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars... And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Will we just read here how he should smite the nations? Or shall, the Lord shall consume him with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with, with the brightness of his coming, the day of the Lord. Okay. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, this is the part I was going to get, when I saw him, when John saw him, I fell as his feet as I was dead. feet as dead. Brother says Christ, this is John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's leaning on his breast. We read a verse here about the son of perdition. Uh, Peter was too scared to ask Jesus himself who it is that should betray him. And he asked John, the disciple that was leaning on Jesus' bosom, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He came back as a lamb. John has his head on his bosom, and is asking Jesus, Jesus, who is it that betrayeth thee? When Jesus comes back, John's acting differently. Why? Because he's coming back as a lion. And no one says it's like unto the Son of Man. In other words, it's like him. It, it, it's got to be Jesus, but it's not the Jesus. I, he doesn't look like the Jesus I remember how he looked like. He comes back as a King of Kings, Lord of Lords. God Almighty manifest in the flesh, coming back to rule and reign for a thousand years, and He's setting things right. Whether you like it or not, 
Or maybe this, that, that statement was for the world, not for the brethren. We like it. We want it. But for the world as a whole, whether you like it or not. Fellow's feet is dead. Brother says Christ, the other thing that that verse gets used for a lot among the brethren is to warn you that not to be too complacent and get too friendly with the Lord and forget who He is. John fell down on his face as dead. Do you reverence Jesus Christ? When you worship Him, you worship Him. Is He actually your capital L Lord? Capital K King. How do you treat a king? How do you treat a Lord? Are you treating Him that way? Today, a lot of these false converts, easy believism, they act like we're just homeboys. We're homeboys. We're Miss Buds. They'd walk up and sit on Jesus' throne and just slap him in the chest and say, What's up, brother? What's, how's it hanging? What's going on? Is that how we're going to act, brother, says Christ? No, no, no. How did John act? Did John see him and go, Hey, how's it going? High five. Yeah, low five. Yeah, what's up? It's been a while, man. I wish I could... What did he do? He fell on his face as if he were dead. Do you reverence Jesus Christ? You know what reverence means? Fear mingled with respect and admiration. Wives are told to reverence their husbands. Okay. Now, a whole other study. But what's reverence mean? Fear mingled with respect. The body of Christ, the bride of Christ, is supposed to reverence Jesus Christ. As the husbandman. We're supposed to fear God. Jesus is God. See, today, that's what gets... I'm sorry to go off a little bit on this. What gets me, brothers, is Christ, is today you have all these people saying, I love Jesus and everything, and they claim with their voice, they claim that Jesus is God, but they don't act like Jesus is God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do you fear Jesus Christ? Do you love Jesus Christ? If any man love me, he will keep my words. If he love me, keep my commandments. Their actions don't say that they fear God and that they love God, but they do with their words. John, he feared God. He fell down at his feet. You say, oh, that's Jesus. That's God that he's fallen down at his feet. God Almighty manifest in the flesh. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Unto me, fear not. He feared. And until God gave him the green light, okay, you can get up. You don't have to be afraid. Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive evermore. Jehovah's Witnesses can't handle that passage. Jesus isn't God. Well, then, because this is, they'll say this is talking about God. Jehovah. When did God die? You ask them that. When did God die? They can't seem. They, they they don't have the truth in them. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them. They need to get saved. For truly saved and born again, according to the Scriptures, they need to get a King James Bible and get rid of that New World Translation. It's a Catholic Bible, and they need to get a King James Bible. Verse eighteen: I am He that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive evermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. So back to this study. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. What about, does it say it's another time? Revelation 19.11. Revelation 19.11, which I believe is really what this is talking about directly. But I want to talk about how God opens his mouth and with a two-edged sword. It would just with his word. That's where his power lies, is in his word. If he says, don't die, you die. If he says, live, you live. He has the keys of both hell and death. If he says you die, you die. If he says you live, you live. If he says you go to hell, you go to hell. If he says you get to go to heaven, you go to heaven. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. You have to go through God manifest in the flesh, his son, Jesus Christ, to go to heaven. You don't go through him to go to heaven, guess what? You're going to end up going through him to go to hell. You say, what are you talking about? At the great white throne judgment. Everybody, the Bible says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, so that every one of us should give an account of himself to God. Every one of us. Saved and lost. We give our account to God at the judgment seat of Christ. We went through Jesus Christ to go to heaven. You have the lost world, predominantly lost world, that's going to be going through Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment 
and they're going to be going to hell. Okay? But Revelation 19, 20, 11, I believe that's more specifically what we're talking about here. Revelation 19, 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in his righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. It's capital W, Word of God. God manifests in the flesh. When Jesus speaks, it's God the Father speaking. That's why he's called the Word of God. Verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of wrath of Almighty God. Out of his mouth wipes the 200 million man army out. Now, Brother Sister Christ, I sat there and I talked with the Lord a lot, and I'm like, I remember, if you remember the story about uh, Peter, and they're in, I think, Gethsemane, the, uh, uh, the Garden of, of Olives. And the people come to get Jesus Christ, and he's so excited, he so wants to defend the Lord, I want to fight for the Lord, I want to fight for the Lord, he pulls out a sword and wipes off that, whacks off that priest, high priest's ear, servants, the high priest's servant's ear. Okay? I kind of want to be like that. We're coming down. Notice it says the army's behind him. I'm like pulling out my sword. I mess up. I'm pulling out my sword. Okay, we're going to fight. Yay! And then God opens his mouth. Jesus opens his mouth. Whew, wipes them all out. And I'm like, oh, I guess we don't have to fight. That's why the Bible says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. God will take care of things. We fight spiritually. We fight for this book spiritually. But we're not supposed to live by the sword. God will take care of it. I'm like... God, we want to fight for you. And he, God goes, let me show you how. Let me show the, the, the battles that are supposed to be fought. The good battles. Spiritual battles. Fighting for the gospel. Fighting for God's word. Fighting for salvation. The, the ministry of reconciliation. The gospel. Fighting to live a life of Christ. Fighting this body of flesh to live a life of Christ. Fighting the lost world as far as not being conformed to this world. Fighting the lost world by saying no. I will not do those things. No, I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. That's the good fight. That's how we fight for the Lord. To be a light, a shining light to this dark world. We're not supposed to actually physically grab a sword and start whacking people's ears off. God will take care of them. Put them without. God judges them that are without. We judge those that are within the body of Christ. But when someone starts getting messed up in the body of Christ, we put them without. If someone's a false convert, we find out they're a false convert, a wolf in sheep's clothing, we put them without. Why? Because God judges them that are without. God will deal with them. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Let God deal with it. Okay? There is fighting. We do get to fight for the Lord. It's just sometimes as men, as a man, I just, I got a sword over there, I can't reach it. But I just want to grab it and go, I want to fight. I want to physically fight. But God always got to tell me, that's not what we're supposed to do. Our, our battle is spiritual. That's why it's called the kingdom of God when it's referring to the spiritual kingdom. Our battle is spiritual, not physical. Okay. I'm pointing over to my sword over there. Not physical. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp, edges, uh, goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and shall, he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders. Even him? Who's the him? Turn to Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. Remember it says, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders. Who's the him here? And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of the devil working miracles. Spirit of the devils, plural, working miracles. 
which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle that great day of God Almighty. But remember it says, Him whose coming is after the work of Satan. Fall power, signs, and lying wonders. Turn to Revelation 19.20. Uh, those three, what, what's more specific? All three are, can take, are trying to take credit for it. Remember, Satan's trying to counterfeit the Godhead. What we see here is a counterfeit of the Godhead. You have the dragon, you have the beast, you have the false prophet. It's a counterfeit of the Godhead. And they're saying when one person does it, all three are trying to claim credit for it. Okay. Now all of them, I believe, are going to be doing miracles. Don't get me wrong. But who's the number one person out of those three? Revelation 19.20 And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. The false prophet works miracles before the beast. The man of sin, the beast is another way of saying the man of sin, the son of perdition. With which he deceived them that have received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. It goes hand in hand. These both were cast alive in the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. We just read in verse 8 where it said, And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall smite, consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The beast. Then it says over here, even him, the false prophet. Who's the him there? The false prophet. Now Paul's not being 100%, but we can compare Scripture with Scripture. Praise God, today he's given us his whole Bible to have in our hands. It's the false prophet. All right. Back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Them. Remember it said even him? And who's the him? We just read it there in Revelation 19.20. I believe he's talking about the false prophet. What does the false prophet do again real quick? Because it says them that perish. What does the false prophet do? With which he deceived them that have received the mark of the beast and them that worship the, his image. His job was to perform miracles, to deceive the nations, so they take the mark and they worship the beast. And if you take the mark and worship the beast, what do you do? You perish. You didn't endure to the end. You failed. You go to hell. And then lake of fire. You failed. And with all deceivableness and of righteousness, deceivableness, who's doing the deceiving then? False, the false prophet. And he's doing it before the beast. Okay, the man of sin, the son of perdition, and the and Satan's there because he's kicked out of heaven. And with all deceivableness of righteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Brothers and Christ, this is the time of Jacob's trouble. This is not for today. It's warning us that this is what happens in the time of Jacob's trouble. There's a different gospel in the time of Jacob's trouble that has works and faith. Faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. That false prophet goes, he deceives him into taking the mark and worshiping the beast. You're done. You're toast. There's no coming back from that. You're not sealed until the day of redemption in the time of Jacob's trouble. The redemption happens at the day of Christ. Once that redemption happens, there's no more seal for the world as a whole. Just 144,000 Jews, Jews from the, uh, so many from the 12 tribes. 22,000, I think, from each of the 12 tribes. I, I, I might be getting that number a little bit wrong, but it equals 144,000. Right. They are sealed. But the world as a whole, there's no seal for the world. You're not in Christ in that time period. Right. You've got to believe the gospel that, that's being preached today, and you have to obey the, the commands of God, the works that He lays down for, for the people that go through that time period. And the works that He lays down is you don't take the mark, and you don't worship the beast. You do that, you're toast. That's where we get in... I think it's James where it says, uh, faith without works is dead, being alone. It has two purposes. I believe there's instruction righteousness and there's doctrine. The doctrine of that teaching is the time of Jacob's trouble. 
Your faith means nothing if you don't keep that commandment of not taking the mark and worshiping the beast. You take that mark and you worship the beast, your faith means nothing. Faith without works is being dead alone. Now for instruction righteousness, anyone who has true faith, true faith in, in the real Jesus Christ, they came to him on his terms, they got saved, they got faith in this book, they got faith in the real Jesus Christ, they have faith in the true plan of salvation, good works will follow. There will be works that are evidence of that faith. There's no such thing as absolutely no works, and oh, but they have faith. No. There will be works that back up your faith. But when you fail God, you can have that faith and still fail God sometimes. Well, yeah, today, you can still have that faith. It still means something to God, even though you fail in brothers as Christ. That's why it says, if we repent, God is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He can forgive you today. Your faith can wa waver a little bit. It can falter. You can have faith and give in to the lust of the flesh. Be, be enticed by the world and fail and fall to the right to the left, and God can bring you back. God can bring you back. In that time of Jacob's trouble, you fall to the right or to the left, your faith is worthless doesn't mean anything to God anymore. It's worthless. Right. Them that perish because they've received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Matthew 24, 22 says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. The elect here, who's he talking about? The Jews. The Jews. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. God goes back to the Jews. And once again, that 144,000. I might be jumping the gun here a little bit again. Uh, Matthew 24, 24. For there shall rise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. Well, is that for today? No. This is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. We just read about the prophet. You have the dragon. You have the beast which is the man of sin, the son of perdition, you have the false prophet. And they're doing this right here. Each one is an antichrist. The beast sets himself up as that antichrist that shall come, I'm God, I'm Jesus. I'm the Christ, I'm the Messiah. But all three are antichrists. Right? False Christ. And shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. If it were possible, how is it not possible? God seals 144,000 Jews in their forehead. And I believe those 144,000 are trying to be a light to the other Jews that are around him to say, Hey, don't take the mark. Don't worship the beast. Don't be deceived. That's not the Christ. That's not our Messiah. Okay. Remember what Daniel wrote about the sin of oblation, you know, that's him. That's why God seals him. If God didn't put that seal on their forehead, and you can read about that seal in Revelation 14, 1 through 3, and Revelation 7, 4 through 8. If he didn't put that seal in there, like I said, unless those days shall be shortened, no flesh should be saved. None. In that time period, I also like to point this out too, brothers and Christ, in that time period, look at today. The average professing Christian that's all like easy believism, they're, they're still, they're carnally minded, walking after the flesh. They're all about the world. And they have a profession of faith. How are they able to enjoy all this unrighteousness? How is this world able to enjoy all its unrighteousness today? The way the system is set up today with money. The banking system, the economy. You want to indulge in the flesh? You gotta have money. You have to go through the worldly system today. You want to have pleasure and unrighteousness? Hardcore pleasure and unrighteousness? You gotta go through the world, like I said, the money. You have to go through the world economic system. What happens when we leave, brothers and Christ, and you have in order to continue living how you're living today? And all this luxury, because like I said, in America, I, I, we live like kings. We do. And a lot of other countries now, too. It's, it's like all over the world. There's hardly any actual third world countries the way third world countries used to be. Okay, there's some third world countries compared to us. 
We keep going up, they go up, but they try to keep separating the three. There's no actual third world countries hardly. There's some. There's some. But you got clothes on your back, you get to eat one to two to three meals a day. Multiple changes of raiment. You're not a third world country. Everyone that is being set up, I believe, brothers and Christ, that when the, we get caught up, I, this, is just, this is just me talking, we get caught up, America gets destroyed. They claim, right now they're trying to claim America is Mystery Babylon. And they're really trying to push that. America gets destroyed. Babylon has fallen. Babylon has fallen. And then when the Antichrist shows up, they're going to think it's the day of Christ. Uh, the day of the Lord, I'm sorry. They're going to think it's the day of the Lord. And they're going to worship him as Jesus, as God. Most of the world will. And in order to, for the world, these professing Christians, in order to be able to continue living the lifestyle that they're living and all the flesh fun, fun is flesh, flesh is fun, and the unrighteousness and everything, what do you got to do? You got to take the mark and worship the beast. Remember what we just read about how it's already being prepared in the world today, that mystery of iniquity, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work? It's everything's being set up today for the time of Jacob's trouble. It is. I'm not saying we can't use the Bible and do Bible studies when I'm going to get, to get ahead of myself again. I'm just trying to warn you, don't get too distracted by the world. Why? Because we're not looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. You're not supposed to be looking for that man of sin, the son of perdition. What are you supposed to be looking for, brother and sister Christ, with the life that you're living? Not with words, not with just with your eyes, but with the life that you're living, what are you supposed to be looking for? That blessed hope. The day of Christ. You're getting ready for the day of Christ. You're not supposed to be getting ready for the time of Jacob's trouble. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 1 Thessalonians 5.3 For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travaileth upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. They shall not escape. Anyone that goes into that time period belongs in that time period. And we're going to get to the verse about the great, the the, um, the strong delusion. We're going to get to that verse about the strong delusion. There's going to be such strong delusion. There's people when you go into that time period, it's because you were a fake, you were a fraud, you were new, ne you were never truly saved and born again. You were never part of the body of Christ. You were never in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And you get into that time period, they're going to come up with some. They're going to have all these excuses. How you're still saved? You're still saved. I guess the body of Christ does go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Those pre-time of Jacob's trouble catch away the body of Christ. People who believe the day of Christ is at hand, the looking for that blessed hope, the catching away the body of Christ happens before. They must have been liars. They must have been deceivers. They're going to have all kinds of deception in that time period to deceive them. You go into that time period. You deserve to go down into that time period. They're lost. They're fakes. They're fraud. And today you have a lot of false religions lying to them. Think about this, brothers and Christ. You have a lot of false religions today lying to them, saying that they won't have to go into that time period. Oh, you can escape. Oh, the catch away already happened. Oh, the day of the Lord already happened. The, you know, the, there is no time of Jacob's trouble. All is well, there is no hell. You know those types of people too? All is well, there is no hell. They shall not escape. I got an old teaching. If you ever want to go watch it, Brother Sis Christ, you have to look it up on the channel. And it's talking about finding the back door, question mark. What is that? There's so many brothers, or not brothers, there's so many people today that are the lost world that are trying so hard to find another way into heaven besides the way that God chose. They've taken repentance out. Oh, repentance is just a work. No, it isn't. They take prayer out. Oh, prayer is just a work. No, it isn't. What's going on? They're trying to find the back door. They're trying to find some way to escape the damnation that's coming. Whether it's them dying and going to hell, or them going through the time of Jacob's trouble. They're trying to do everything they can to escape it, when this is how you do it. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. You have to come to God with a broken and contrite spirit, repenting. 
broken, contrite spirit, having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins, for your sinful, wicked state that's sending you to hell and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God and you regret ever sinning against God. Lord, I am so sorry, Lord. I don't want to go to hell and I deserve to go to hell, Lord. I'm just so sorry. What do I do? I can't do anything. I've tried. Some brethren have. They have testimonies. They've tried different ways. They've tried back doors. Not this. They, they, they weren't going this way. They were trying the back doors. I've tried my way. I've tried so many different ways. My way. I can't do it. What do I do, Lord? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou, be, thou shalt be saved. How Jesus died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You confess both your repentance and your belief to God in prayer. And then whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God looks at the heart. Through the word of God, he sees the heart, the thoughts and intents of the heart. God looks at the heart. That's God's way. You have to come to God on His terms. That's God's terms. You've got to come broken. The first step is being broken. And today, that's been almost completely wiped out. They've skipped it completely. Why? They're trying to find a back door. They're trying to find some way other than coming to God broken. They shall not escape. They shall not escape. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. And for this cause, this is where I was button heads with the brother in Christ, because he's taken this verse and he's using it for today, and it's not for today. Paul's warning about the time of Jacob's trouble. The gospel in the time of Jacob's trouble. You take the mark, you worship the beast, you're toast. You don't have the gospel that we have today exactly. Half of it is. The faith side is the same as today, but now there's works added. That's why I believe people get so confused with Hebrews, uh, James, First and Second Peter, because they hey say they say hey look the faith side it lines right up with us and it does. But there's works added now, and that's what they can't seem to comprehend. There's works added, and that's what confuses people when it talks about blotting your your name out and this and that that, that makes it sound like you can lose your salvation. How do we compare that to that? You don't compare it to today. You don't try to make it make sense today. It's for the time of Jacob's trouble. You can get your name blotted out in the time of Jacob's trouble. Right? And for this cause, what is this cause? Okay, we'll get to that. God shall send them, who's the them, and what's the cause? Those are the two key parts here that brethren are making mistakes. Send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. What is this cause? Well, we just read it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Turn to Mark chapter 13, verse 14. Mark 13, 14. What's this cause? But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, who's the ye? He's talking about the Jews. How do we know that? Keep reading. Spoken of Daniel by, the, by Daniel the prophet, stand where it ought not in the temple, claiming to be Jesus Christ. God, man, says, I'm your king. He's an antichrist. We're standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Jews. But what does that cause? When you shall see the abomination of desolation, stand where it ought not, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, and that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple as God, showing himself that he is God. Turn to Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. What does this cause? It's very clear. Revelation 13, 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and unto his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. 
for the name of blasphemy. I'm the Christ. I'm the Son of the living God. Blasphemy. The man of sin, the son of perdition. Blasphemy. Verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him pa his power and his seat and great authority. Now, uh, 33rd book does a great study. It's called uh, Rabbit Trails, and he's going through Daniel, because this is mentioned in Daniel first, and then you get to read it about here. And what this is, is these are nations that shall rise when Daniel's given that prophecy. These are future nations. And what it talks about is, remember we read about how all the nations submit themselves to the man of sin, the son of perdition. That's what this is talking about. All these animals represent the nations. And they all submit himself to the beast in that one world order that happens. He has, uh, he's, he, you can liken it to all these nations because all these nations come together as one under him. Okay, That's the cause, but let's keep going so he can be worshipped by the whole world. And I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Not just some. Not just a little bit. There might be a small but It actually says all the world. All the world. Wondered after the beast. Verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to con continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. Remember, right now our bodies is a temple for the Holy Ghost. Remember that. When someone tries to tell you that we go into the time of Jacob's trouble, how can the man of sin set himself in the temple, and the tabernacle? Today your body is a holy temple. Is he setting in you? No. There will be a rebuilt temple, a tabernacle, where he's going to try to rule right. It's in Jerusalem. Can you believe there's people out there trying to push? There's some still. That's very. I don't know how big the movement is. But there's some people that are even trying to say Jerusalem is Mystery Babylon. Can you imagine that, Brother Jesus Christ? Sorry for the, the little another little rabbit trail. Can you imagine that? God blows up Jerusalem. Yay, Mystery Babylon has fallen, it has fallen. And he comes down, we read about the horses, we've read about it already. And with the mouth, he opens his mouth, the sword, he wipes out the 200 million men army. The Bible says he's going to run, ride triumphantly into his city. And he's going to set himself up in his temple. And he's going to be God. He's going to be king of kings, Lord of lords, the Messiah, the Christ. He goes to head to Jerusalem, he gets to the front gate of where, where the gate should be, where Jerusalem, the whole city's gone. Can you imagine that? He just like... Um, oh yeah, um, I blew it up. Um, well, hey okay, guys, I guess we just head back home. Let's head back up to heaven. Let's go. See how stupid that is? But there's people out there that are promoting just anything as Mystery Babylon other than the Catholic Church, Catholicism, Catholic Rome, everything but them, anything but them. It's just stupidity. To blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. He blasphemes the, the, the temple. And them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Except for the 144,000 that are sealed in their forehead. They're the only ones. Shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Like I said, that last part left it open for there might be a little small remnant of maybe some Gentiles that get through. When it says whose names are not written in the book of life. Because it does that little quick clause. But it makes it out very clear that most of the world is going to go for him hook, line, and sinker. And we're getting into it where it talks about the strong delusion. But for this cause, what's the cause? The man of sin, the son of perdition, 
You miss the catching way of the body of Christ. You go into the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble where God goes back to dealing with the Jews. And the man of sin sets himself up. That's the cause. If any man have an ear, let him hear. What's the strong delusion that we just read in there? For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. That lie that the man of sin, the son of perdition, is God. We just read about that. Blaspheming, 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 blaspheming. He's blaspheming his name. He's blaspheming his temple. He's a blasphemer. The Bible and the whole world buys it hook, line, and sinker and worships the beast. The physical man of sin as Jesus Christ. We just read about it. That lie that the man of sin, the son of perdition, is God, and that the whole world as a whole will buy into it and worship him. Revelation 17, 17, we read, For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. Okay? His will. Who gives, oh, who gives the man of sin, the son of perdition, the power to do what he's doing? Who's sending that strong delusion? God is. And for this cause, God shall send a strong delusion. All right, let me finish reading this real quick. For God put it in their hearts to fulfill His will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast unto the word, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. God's moving the pieces around. Satan, the world would have you believe Satan's in charge. He is the lowercase g God of this world, but he's only the lowercase g God of this world because God, capital G God the Father, has given him the world. And God, he has to get permission from God anytime any piece gets moved around. So it's God, the Father, that's moving all the pieces around. We read how the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Today, God's moving the pieces around. Okay? Revelation 6.1, turn to Revelation 6.1. Who gives, remember it says, we read up here in Revelation 13.7, and power was given him over all kindreds. Power was given him? Who gives the man of sin the power and authority to do what he's doing? That strong delusion? That already tells us who gives the strong delusion. Who's giving the strong delusion? God is. Who gives him his power? God does. Revelation 6.1 Don't be deceived, brother, says Christ, when you have someone saying that there's the, the wrath of God doesn't happen until three and a half years in. They're liars. They're deceivers. The wrath of God begins at the very beginning when Satan gets kicked out of heaven and that first seal gets opened, which causes the body of Christ to be caught up and the man of sin to be revealed. Remember, one cannot happen without the other. It's not a contradiction in the Bible. One cannot happen without the other. If you see the catch away of the body of Christ, the man of sin is revealed. If you see the man of sin revealed, the catch away of the body of Christ has happened. They go hand in hand. Don't be deceived either way. But Revelation 6, 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard it where was a noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Who starts the time of Jacob's trouble? God does. I, I, I did say the event. When Satan gets kicked out of heaven and he draws a third of the stars with him, God will, Jesus Christ will open that seal and boom! Starts the time of Jacob's trouble and it starts the catching away of the body of Christ. The catching away of the body of Christ and that man of sin being revealed can't happen until God says so. Brothers says Christ, don't forget that. Who's in charge? God is. God is in charge. That strong delusion, we just read about it. I don't have to reread it. We just read about it. The whole world is going to worship him as Jesus Christ. Now today we have, we've had people stand up and say, Hey, I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus. We had little cults here and there. And you have people today that worship in the Catholic Church. They'll worship that priest every time he does the Eucharist. They're supposed to see Jesus Christ. He becomes Jesus Christ. But it's not the same thing as the man of sin, the son of perdition. It's just spiritual. It's just spiritual. This is a time period where a physical man is going to be setting himself up as God. It's the strong delusion. A brother in Christ, I was talking to him 
remember, when you read that, it says, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And we're going to get into the next verse here in a second. But, uh, trying to get back to, yeah, the next verse where it says that they all might be damned. He's going to send that delusion, they're going to take the mark, they're going to worship the beast, and then they're all damned to go to hell while they're still breathing. They're damned to go to hell. Now, is God doing that today? The problem I'm having with the brother in Christ is he's taking that verse and he's applying it to today, saying there's people out there that are still breathing, that are, that are believing a strong delusion, and they're damned to go to hell, and there's nothing they can do to get saved. It's like Calvinism. There are certain people that are destined to go to heaven, and there are certain people that are destined to go to hell. And I'm probably getting ahead of myself today, a little bit again. But, brothers Chris Christ, there's a difference between can't get saved and won't get saved. If you're still breathing today, today, anyone can get saved. There is no strong delusion today that's preventing anybody from getting saved. The people that don't get saved is because they don't want to get saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. All men. Saved and lost. Why would you do that? If, if there's strong delusion that they all might be damned, why would you be doing it with Paul be saying this in 1 Timothy that supplication, prayer, intercession, intercession, the ministry of reconciliation, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority, that they may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all goodness and honesty. Sometimes we pray that, Lord, keep them off our backs. We want them to get saved, Lord. We want to see them get saved. But, Lord, keep them off our back so we can continue living for you and continue doing the ministry without too much hindrance. Remember Paul. There was times where Satan hindered, buffeted him and hindered him from the work. He said so in the Paul epistles. Pray that they keep him off our backs so we can continue doing the work of the Lord. Here it is for verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our, our Savior. Who, verse 4, who will have all men to be saved. He's talking about today. Today, in the time of the Gentiles, from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ, when salvation was no longer just of the Jews, but it went out to the world, including Gentiles and Jews, which is why it's called the time of the Gentiles, he will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. When you take that verse there, Verse 11 and 12, and you try to make it about today, it's for today, it's for today, it contradicts that right there. But this book doesn't contradict. The brother in Christ who's taken those verses and trying to apply it to today, he's the one that's in the air. He's the one that's wrong. And any other brother in Christ, or even false converts, misusing the word of God. Verse 11 and 12 are for the time of Jacob's trouble. And he's letting us know what the, the gospel is in the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm getting ahead of myself. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Who is the deceiver today? Is God trying to deceive the world today? Or letting that strong delusion? He's not deceiving the world, but is he letting a strong delusion go run rampant where he's for it, he's backing it, so that people will... will that they all might be damned, that they go to hell and then lake of fire. No. Who's the deceiver today? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Would to God ye could bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as that serpent beguiled Eve... Through his subtlety. What's that serpent? Satan. So your mind should be, should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, that's going on today, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which we have not received, or another gospel, which we have not accepted, 
ye might well bear with him. Who's to him? Satan. Where's Satan going to go? The lake of fire someday. You read that in the book of Revelation. He gets thrown in the bottomless pit. God rules and reigns for a thousand years. He's let loose for a little while to deceive the nations. And then the heaven and earth is destroyed. And a new heaven and earth is going to be created. But before the new heaven and earth is created, I believe, you have the judgment, the great white throne judgment. And Satan's going to be judged, and he's going to be tossed in hell. He's going to be brought before all of us, and we're going to watch Jesus judge him, and he's going to say, throw him in the lake of fire. And everyone that goes to the lake of fire, you're going to where Satan goes. It was created for the devil and his angels. So you might well bear with him. Turn to 2 Corinthians, or just jump down to verse 13. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. All these wolves in sheep's clothing, who do they work for? Let's keep reading. Verse 14, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Who's the great deceiver? Satan. And his children, remember it says, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning, and the father of it. There's people that are serving Satan today. Absolutely. There are wolves in sheep's clothing. I know it's so simple to look at them and go, okay, they can't get saved. That's a wrong way to look at it, brothers and Christ. They won't get saved because they've chosen a side, and it's the wrong side. But there are men that have come out of being hardcore servants of Satan. They've come out of those wicked religions. They've come out of those wicked cults. And they've, God has saved them. They can get saved. But will they all get saved? No. A lot of them have, made, have hardened their hearts. They've made, their mind. They've made up their minds. But can they get saved? Absolutely. It's between them and the Lord. Brothers and Christ, when it comes down to it, despite all our headbutting, Brothers and Christ, just a little side note, beside all this button heads and the division and fighting amongst each other, do you not realize that when it comes down to it, at the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be you standing here and God standing up here on the throne? Jesus Christ. You can sit here and try to say, what about this person? What about that person? What about it's just going to be you and Jesus Christ. The, the judgment seat of Christ. Brother, sis Christ, the lost world, they can try to claim everything. It's just going to be the lost person and Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment. No one else. That's why I keep telling the brethren, you need to work on you. You need to focus on you and your walk with the Lord and make sure that you line up with this book. Don't be too distracted at getting caught up in everything else. Now, these lost people, they need to get saved. These wicked servants of Satan, they need to get saved. Will they get saved? Probably not. Some do. Some do. Let's keep reading. Who's the great deceiver today, though? Satan and his minions, I would say minions, but Satan and his servants, his children. John 8, 43, not God. John 8, 43. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and bode not in the truth, because the truth there is no truth in him. When he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Who's the deceiver today? Satan is. Who's sending that strong delusion in the time of Jacob's trouble? God is. Who's trying to deceive people today to prevent them from getting saved? Well, they can't. He can't. But he's strongly putting up all these roadblocks. Satan's putting all these roadblocks. The world, remember, he's the lowercase g God of this world. He's setting up all these roadblocks trying to keep as many people from getting saved as possible. But like I said, what it always comes down to is the person in Jesus Christ. 
It's always going to come down to the person. Did you humble yourself? Did you come in a broken and contrite spirit and submit yourself to God's way and come to God on His terms? Well, the world, the world's not the one who's at fault. You are. Yeah, but Satan, he deceived me. It's not Satan's not at fault. You are. Yeah, but this wicked body of flesh that I had, it's not your flesh's fault. It's your fault. It's going to come down between you and the Lord. And you can try to blame anything and everything. But who's the deceiver today? Satan is. He is deceiving you. But he only deceives those that are simple. He deceives those that want to be deceived. He deceives those who say, yeah, I'd rather have what he has to offer than what God's offering. I'd rather do things his way than God's way. You're still making a choice. Even if you're deceived, you're still making a choice. Right. Now, the wolves in sheep's clothing today are preparing the lost world for the time of Jacob's trouble. They are. They're put, there's a lot of them out there saying there is no catching away of the body of Christ, but the man of sin is going to be revealed. What did we just read about that? That's a lie. You have people saying the last, uh, that the um, catching away already happened without the man of sin being revealed. That's also a lie. Right. There is no man of sin. But we'll be caught up, but there is no man that that's a lie. They both go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. But you got they're, 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 they're getting people ready for the time of Jacob's trouble with the fleshliness, with the way the world's going. Okay? And like we talked about, in order to have that flesh and have that flesh fun and have pleasure and unrighteousness today, they've got it all set up around money and the economy. The average person is so dependent on their, their country and uh, the economic structure of the world. Some of them say, even go as far as to say you can take the mark and be saved. Do you remember those false preachers? I think it was uh, Robert Breaker said you can, if you, that some people, when they're in the time of Jacob's trouble, when you see, they took the mark and they worship the beast, when you see Jesus coming, you just cut off your hand and you're good to go. See, Christians can take the mark and worship the beast and be saved. There's no Christians in the time of Jacob's trouble. There's only saints. There's no body of Christ in the time of Jacob's trouble. You're not in Christ. You have to endure to the end. The end is when you stand before Jesus Christ. Not when you see Jesus Christ, you cut your hand off. No, the end is when you stand before Jesus Christ. And the moment you took that mark and worshipped the beast, you can cut off your arm, you can cut off the other arm, you can cut off your head, you can cut off any body part you want, and it won't make a difference. You took that mark, you worship the beast, you go to hell and the lake of fire. You're toast. But you got people preparing today, trying to get these people thinking that, hey, the body of Christ goes in the time of Jacob's trouble. Oh, you can take the mark and worship the beast, because remember, you're sealed into the day of redemption. And, and... But that redemption already happened, and they're lying to you. When the cast away of the body of Christ happens, the redemption happens. That seal is broken, it is no longer there. I've talked with brother about this, I said, don't you know how the, the letters, when a king would write a letter, he'd put a wax on it, and he would seal it with his ring. And that seal would remain until it gets to the person that that letter belongs to, and then that person would break that seal, and that letter would no longer be sealed. We are sealed until the day of redemption. That seal is fixed until Jesus Christ, and we read about the different, like I said, Satan gets kicked out of heaven. He opens that first seal. When God breaks that seal and says, Body of Christ, come up hither. It's done. There's no more seal. But no, you can take the mark more speed. You can cut off your hand when Jesus comes back. No true Christian would ever take the mark. See, that Satan's trying to set up some of that delusion today, absolutely. But that strong delusion is a specific strong delusion. And it's talking about the man of sin, people taking the mark and worshiping the beast. And worship him as Jesus Christ, as the Messiah, as the Christ, as God manifests in the flesh, as God. They're going to be worshiping him. That's the strong delusion. 
Now here's a big warning to the brethren too. You have even have brethren distracted the body of Christ with the time of Jacob's trouble today. Like I said, I got into it with the brother and said, listen, are you looking for that blessed hope? Are you looking for the time of Jacob's trouble? Are you looking for the man of sin, the son of perdition? That's what the world is looking for, brother, says Christ. Think about it. That man of sin sets himself up. It says, the Bible talks about him being an angel of light. Someone who's wise. Not just an angel trying to counterfeit Jesus Christ being the angel of the Lord, but of light. Wisdom, he's so wise. He comes back, he has all the solution. The world as a whole is waiting for a man to come back and solve everything. That mankind can solve mankind's problems. That's what they're looking for. What are we looking for, brothers and sisters Christ? We're looking for Jesus Christ to take us home. We're looking to go home and be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And until that happens, God has need of us. We need to live a life of Christ. We need to be living for Him. Sanctification, hiding God's Word in our heart, living it, being an ambassador for Jesus Christ, the ministry of reconciliation. We need to be living for Jesus Christ until He calls us home. We're looking to, be, to go home and be with our Lord and Savior someday. But the world as a whole, the lost world, they're looking for a man. They're looking for mankind to stand up and solve all their problems. They're looking for that man of sin. Whether they, want, they don't call him the man of sin, but they're looking for the man of sin, the son of perdition. What are we supposed to be looking for? That blessed hope. But you have brethren that have ministries that are engineered. I'm telling brethren, stay away from them. Stay away from them. Any time of ministry where the, the whole ministry is it's like 90, 80%, 100%, it's primarily based off of end times prophecies and the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Stay away from them. Right? Stay away from them. A good example also is to stay away from so-called Christian news ministries. Stay away from them. Why? Because they're getting you to look for the man of sin, the son of perdition. They're getting you to look at the world and not look at Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. What are new so-called Christian news ministries? They're entangling themselves with the affairs of this life. What are so-called end-time pro end prophecy channels? They're looking for the time of Jacob's trouble, and they're getting entangled with the affairs of this life. Now, brothers and Christ, when we look out in the world and we see how bad it's getting, it's supposed to motivate us to keep our eyes on that blessed hope. It can happen any day, and we need to live for Jesus Christ. When we see the persecution get more and more out there, we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ saying, Hey, I might have to die for Jesus Christ, and I get to go home and be with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I need to get busy making sure I'm doing right. That when God calls me home, He looks at me and says, Well done, thou faithful servant. Well done, well done, thou good and faithful one. Not that he just looks at you and shakes his head and goes, I'm so disappointed in you, you are a vessel unto dishonor. Remember what Paul talks about? God knows them that are his. In God's house there's not only vessels of silver and gold, but of wood and earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. When you go home to be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, are you going to be a vessel unto honor? Or are you going to be a vessel unto dishonor? When you see what's going on out there, it's to motivate us to be that vessel of honor. It's to motivate us to get busy for the Lord, make sure I'm reading this book, hiding it in my heart. I should be starting my day with the Word of God. I should be ending my day with the Word of God. I should be praying without ceasing. I should always be talking to the Lord about anything and everything. Making my request be made known unto God, asking Him for wisdom, asking for help, praying for the brethren, praying for lost people I want to see get saved. I need to be a light to the dark, lost world, this dark, wicked world. I need to be a light. How do you be a light? Sanctification. You set yourself apart from the world and you live God's way. You do things God's way. You don't render evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. 
But you don't entangle himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. Chosen him to be a soldier. Now, did God, did Paul say preach the world? Or did he say preach the news? Like I said, there's nothing wrong with you saying, hey, I saw this out there. This is what the Bible says. And you do a Bible study. I'm not against Bible studies, brothers and Christ. I'm against ministries that are predominantly just pointing at the world and getting your eyes on the world, getting you distracted by the world, fear-mongering. We're not given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. We're not appointed to God's wrath, but you start looking at how bad it's getting out in the world, you start fear-mongering. Did Paul say preach the world, the news? Turn to 2 Timothy 4.1. What did Paul say to do? Now, real quick. Paul did have prophecies about the world and the future. What's going on in the world today and the future, to a point. But he wasn't sitting there saying, Okay, guys, I've got the newsletter, and let me tell you everything that's going on in the world today. That wasn't what Paul was doing. What did Paul say to do? 2 Timothy 4.1 I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing which we're talking about here and his kingdom the day of the Lord when Jesus comes back and rules and reigns. Comes back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble to set everything right and set up his kingdom. Two, what are we supposed to do? Preach the word. There's no such thing as a news ministry that's, that's valid. There's no such thing as a ministry that just pre predominantly is focused on end times. There's nothing wrong with a ministry that talks about end times every once in a while, but I'm talking about a ministry that their sole ministry is 100% about end times, the time of Jacob's trouble. We're to preach the word. Now, is the Jacob, time of Jacob's trouble in here? Yes. Is the book of Revelation in here? Yes. But the Pauline epistles are in here also. How we're supposed to live today is in here. We're supposed to preach the word, all of it. Predominantly for today, the Pauline epistles. But we're supposed to preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Why? Because when brethren stop preaching this and start preaching the world, what happens? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. There are brethren that have been gotten so distracted by the world, they've turned their back on the day of Christ is at hand, looking, present tense, for that blessed hope that we may be redeemed from this wicked world. Paul talks about may. You get distracted by that by the world, and there's brethren that are falling away from sound doctrine. They're making a mess of the Bible. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. There's the wolves in sheep's clothing of the world that actually tell the world what they want to hear. That's why you got so many false converts today. But you have brethren that were great teachers of God that are going the way of the world. And they're taking a lot of people with them because itching ears. He's going that way, and that what he's going, trying to support sin, justify sin for a season, lust of the flesh, worldliness, idolatry. I want that. So I'm going to follow him. Verse 4, what's going on? People are getting distracted by the world, and they're forgetting this. This is what we preach. This is what we stand for. This is what's important. Verse 4, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Fables. But watch thou in all things. See that thing? Oh, we're supposed to be watching for the time of Jacob's trouble. No, it says watch thou in all things. It's talking about your personal life and your personal walk with the Lord. Your ministry. What's around you. Watch all things. Why are we watching? Because we're looking for that blessed hope. Is it time, Lord? The world's getting pretty bad. Is it time, Lord? The body of Christ, that remember we just read about, the falling away, and then that man of sin shall be revealed? The body of Christ is in a horrible condition, Lord. We're dividing over anything and everything. Fables. Talking to a brother in Christ where people have their theories. I throw that under fables. If you have a theory, there's nothing wrong with having little theories here and there. But the reason I don't make huge videos on theories, like gap theory, flat earth theory, and so on and so forth. 
globe earth, whatnot. I don't make huge studies on theories because they're fables until they can be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt with the Word of God. And people are dividing over theories. The body of Christ, the condition of the body of Christ is deteriorating more and more. Brethren are forgetting to have brotherly love. They're showing bitterness and hate one for another. They're devouring one another. The name calling, the backbiting, the whispering, the mocking, railing for railing, the division. Watch now in all things. Lord, I see this. I see the falling away. Endure affliction. As more of us try and try, Brother Sister Christ, to stand, we're going to keep seeing brethren fall away. The more we get closer, we could endure more and more affliction as we get closer and closer to the catching away of the body of Christ. But we're to endure that affliction. We're to endure it. Do the work of an evangelist. There are brethren that are so distracted by the time of Jacob's trouble that they have the attitude, I'm not going to preach the gospel except by divine intervention. No, you're supposed to be doing the work of the evangelist, period. You're supposed to be planting seeds, period. You're supposed to be going out and preaching the gospel if you have a ministry. Gospel tracting. You can be street witnessing. You can preach the gospel on here. I preach the gospel a lot in almost a lot of my studies. Brother says Christ. We're to preach the gospel and plant as many seeds as possible until God calls us home. Right? We always talk about having open doors when if I'm going out and I'm doing some shopping and God opens a door, I will go through that door and I'll preach the gospel. If I'm preaching the gospel here, I'm going to preach it. And anybody that watches it, whether they want the gospel or not, they're getting it. If I was going out on the street corner with a sign and, and hollering the gospel... Whoever walks by, whether they want it or not, they're getting it. When we talk about doors, we're talking about there's times where you're going to be the least expecting it, and you're in the middle of doing something else, and God might open a door for you to witness. And you need to be have your eyes open for it, and not be distracted by entangled with the affairs of this life, the world, what you're doing. Okay, You need to always have your eyes open and ready, Paul uh, Peter, uh, Peter talks about in First and Second Peter, always be ready to give an answer of the hope that is in you. Always be ready. Always be ready. Okay. But we're to do the work of an evangelist. But a lot of people aren't doing it. They're just sitting back going, oh, the world doesn't want the gospel, so, eh, I'm not going to give it to them. Now, don't get me wrong, I feel that way sometimes. But I don't stop giving them the gospel. Why? Because the Bible says we're still to give them the gospel. We're to keep going. Now, I've told brethren this before. You're witnessing to somebody. They don't want the truth. You move on to somebody else. But you move on to somebody else. You don't say, okay, he doesn't want the gospel, so then, therefore the world doesn't want the gospel. I'm done. You turn around and go home. No, you move on to somebody else because you're trying to find that one person that does want the gospel that does want the truth, that God has broken and got him in a broken and contrite state waiting for you to come and preach to him the gospel of our salvation. You keep moving on to the next one, then to the next one, and then to the next one. You keep going. But a lot of people are fizzling out. They're burning out. And they're like, I'm not doing it. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full, full proof of thy ministry. Are we supposed to be preaching the news and preaching the world? Or are we supposed to be preaching the, the Word of God? Some people, I don't want to get into it too much, but some people are perverting the Scriptures so that they can have the lust of the flesh, their idolatry, and worldliness. And then they mess up the Scriptures and they're preaching doctrines of devils. They're preaching heresies. So they can feel more comfortable about going the way of the world. And, and go along with the flesh. Watch out for those. Watch out for those. But real quick, back to the news thing. Sometimes I wonder how the brethren of the past survived without knowing everything that was going on in the world. Do you ever stop to think of that, brothers of Christ? Eh, probably like two. Let's go back 200. That's a long time, but let's go back 200 years ago plus. All you knew was what's going on around you. You didn't need to know everything that was going on in the world to tell that the world was going downhill. You could just look at what's around you. Can I get an amen on that? 
Right now, all I have to do is look at these towns that I live in in Oregon and look at the towns around me. I look at the people and I see how wicked they are. Sodomy is out of control. Just in here, in the up and down the town, sodomy is out of control. Feminism's out of, feminism is out of control. A lot of people here worship an antichrist. And when I try to preach the true Jesus Christ to them, found in the pages of the King James Bible, they want nothing to do with it. I can tell how bad the world's getting by just looking around me. Brethren, 200 years ago, all the way back to Paul's day, they had no clue exactly everything that's going on in the world. How did they ever survive? Oh my gosh, it just, how could, it's almost like telling these people that are addicted to cell phones. You know the, the technology of the phone is only like, like sending messages without writing letters? Like the telegraph and wire, I think it's like 100, between 100 and 150 years old. Man, what did people do before cell phones? It's the, those people act like it's the end of the world. If I don't have my cell phone. These people seem to be addicted to the world and the news. Brother Jesus Christ, we don't need to know everything that's going on in the world. I had a brother Christ hit me up and said, Did you know this was going on oh, across, like halfway across the world? And I was like, No, I didn't know that was going on. What? You don't know? You need to know what's going on in the world. It's like, Ew. It's like, No, I don't. This has got the world's number. Remember the, the preacher? There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. This has got the world's number. I don't need to know everything that's going on in the world. I don't. And here's another thing. Everything that's going on in the world, brothers and sisters Christ, individually, other than prayer, because I always believe we can pray for things, other than prayer, can you do anything about it? No. Who's, who's bringing, this stuff to, uh, bringing this stuff about? God is. Are you going to fight against God? Are you going to pray against God? I pray for their salvation, that God will get as many people saved out of how bad this world is getting. And that God will use me as a light. Use me as a servant for Him to this dark world. But I'm not saying, hey, we should fix this, and we should fix this, and we can do something about this. That's the biggest thing about these news ministries. You ask them, what can we do about it? Oh, there's nothing we can do about it. Then why are you making a whole ministry based off of it? This is something we can do about it. We can hide this in our heart and live it. Our own personal lives, we can do something about it. Walking for the Lord and living for the Lord. We can't force the world to do right. We can only force, I can only, I can only make this man do right. I can't make the world do right. Be careful, brothers and Christ, be very careful. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure and unrighteousness. Who's the they? That they all might be damned. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10. And with all deceivableness, deceivableness, we talked about that, the false prophet comes in, and deceives them into taking the mark and worshiping the beast. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, how does he deceive them into taking the mark? Like I said, look at the way the world is today. You take away the money system of this world today, people will just cry and fall apart and go crazy and they'll go nuts. You take their phones away, you take their computers away, you take their TVs away, they go nuts. You take their video games away, they go nuts. They go crazy. You, there was a time on the, the springtime and summertime, there was a time on the beach, kids would be on the beach, kids would be in the park, they would be playing. But now they're all on their phones and their tablets and video games and behind the TV. Could you imagine them the, taking all that away? If you want it back, take the mark and worship the beast. The food, how you eat today. We eat like, look, like kings today. Oh, you want to eat like kings again? you got to take the mark and worship the beast. With all this evil with us and of righteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They didn't get saved today. They go into that time period. They take the mark and they worship the beast. And when you take the mark and you worship the beast, you're going to be damned. That they might be damned. Both verse 10 and 12 are for the time of Jacob's trouble, and you have brethren using these verses to say a person cannot get saved while they're still breathing today. They're doomed to go to hell while they're still breathing. 
Brother says, Beth, I disagree. I believe today anybody can get saved up to their dying breath. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not a big fan of, of uh, um, what was called deathbed confessionals. Why? Because Paul said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see whether they are of God. Examine where they be in the faith. Prove your own selves. When someone gives their life to Christ right before they die, deathbed confessionals, you don't know if it was real or not. And you'll never know until we get up to heaven. In this life, you'll never know. I don't like that. Because the Bible says otherwise. We're supposed to test. And when someone gives their life, can someone give their life and truly get saved and die? Yes. Can someone give a false profession of faith and then die? Yes. Can you tell which is which? No. That's why I don't like deathbed confessionals. We'll find out when, as far as saying there, that's guaranteed saved. I, I, I'm all for it happening, period. Don't get me wrong, because I'd rather it happen and then, and then you know, wait till we get up there and pray that it was true and it was genuine. But I'm saying, I will not sit there and say, that was another brother and sister in Christ who got saved. I'm going to put a tally on my card. You know, all these uh, Babel buildings, they're always keeping tallies of how many people they led to Christ. Oh, I'm going to put her on my tally or him on my tally. I wouldn't do that. You don't know. You can only pray that, Lord, now that they're in your hands, I pray it was genuine, and I'll find out someday when I get there. But someone can get saved up to their dying breath. If they still have breath in them, they can still get saved. Can't get saved and won't get saved are two different things. I think some of the brethren are messing that up. They're messing it up. There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't believe that person will wind up getting saved. Their heart is so hardened. They've, they're, they're choosing the world. I don't know what it'll take to break their heart. That, you know, break that rock, that hard heart. You know, God, it's, there's some people I've seen where God has broken their heart many, many, many times, and they just keep hardening it, and hardening it, and hardening it, and God will get to the point where He's like, I'm done. I've tried, I'm done. But, brother says, Christ, while you're still breathing, you can get saved. Can get saved, won't get saved, those are two different things. There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't believe this person will get saved. They, they just don't want to get saved. No matter how many times I try to witness to them, they keep throwing me off. and they, I just They don't want to get saved. They don't want to. There's a difference. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in righteousness. These people are damned while they're breathing. Period. They take the mark, they worship the beast, they're damned. While they're breathing, they're damned. Now, I, I got into this with the brother in Christ, and I talked with him, and I said, listen, I believe today in, in John 3, 16, 17, when you get to 17 or 18, it talks about he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. I'm condemned, before I got saved, I was condemned to go to hell because I'd already sinned against God. I was already guilty. The sentence was passed. It just hasn't been carried out. This, I believe, it's talking about that they all might be damned. The sentence is carried out. You've got one foot in the grave, one foot in hell, one foot in the lake of fire. You're going there. It's guaranteed. There's no way out at that point. You're damned. That's what it means to be damned. There's no way out. Revelation 14.9 and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they had no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoso receiveth the mark of his name. And then we just read about the strong delusion. The whole world buys into it. They're going to have some kind of substitute for Mystery Babylon. I believe it's probably going to be America. It goes under. It gets destroyed. Hey, Mr. Babylon's destroyed. This is the real Jesus Christ that's coming back. And the whole world is going to buy into a hook, line, and sinker. And everyone, everyone that takes the mark, worships the beast, they are now damned. 
that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. What's the truth in that time period? Don't take the mark and worship the beast. That's not Jesus Christ. You need to believe in the real Jesus Christ and you have to endure to the end and then ye shall be saved. They believe not the truth. In the time of Jacob's trouble, you take the mark and worship the beast, you are done. Even if you're still breathing. Just read my notes real quick. Even if you're still breathing, so I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Whereas today, if you're still breathing, if there's still breath in you, you can still get saved. Once again, can get saved and will get saved are two different things. And brethren need to make a distinction between the two. They really do. They're getting to the point where they're getting into heresies by saying someone can't get saved while they're still breathing. Yes, they can. Will they get saved? Probably not. Can they get saved? Absolutely. Anyone can get saved today. In that time period, you take the mark and, the worship, and you worship the beast, you can not get saved. But that's not for this dispensation. This is the fear that's being put in the 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. I go into this time period where you can't get saved. You take the mark. You worship the beast. You can't get saved. God's pouring out His wrath and His judgment. on. It's a fearful time period. It's the worst time period. There's none like it. I have to go into that time period and now i got to endure. The, they're fear-mongering the Thessalonians. And Paul's got to come in and comfort them and, and bring them back to the catching way of the body of Christ that happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. We don't go through it. Brothers and Christ, we don't go through it. The strong delusion here is that the man of sin will be worshipped as God manifests in the flesh, an antichrist, a fake Jesus. And the world is going to fall for it, hook, line, and sinker. And we can see, yes, we can see people getting prepared for it today. But that man of sin, the son of perdition, in the flesh has not been revealed yet. The Antichrist spirits out there in the world preparing the people, preparing the world. But the man of sin in the flesh has not appeared yet. 1 John 4, 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now is already in the world. It's already in the world. Once again, brothers and Christ, be careful. There are brethren, and even false wolves in sheep's clothing, but there are brethren that are falling for it. Brethren that I love, I'm saying this with brotherly love, that are using 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 to say that someone cannot get saved today whatsoever while they're still breathing, they can't get saved. That is a doctrine of devils. I'm just going to say that right out. That is a doctrine of devils. Anyone can get saved today while you're still breathing. You have to die in your sins to go to hell today. You guys remember that. You have to die in your sins. Not in unbelief. In your sins. Not washed away. Which is an unbelief, but it's not the unbelief that's sending you to hell. It's your sins. Plural. That are sending you to hell. In that time of Jacob's trouble, if you take the mark, you worship the beast, while you're alive, you're going to hell. You, I mean, you're, you're there. You're doomed. You might as well be there, in other words. There's a difference in dispensations, brothers and Christ. The body of Christ does not go into the time of Jacob's trouble. And the Thessalonians are being fear-mongered into thinking that they missed the catching away, or it doesn't happen before the man of sin comes in. They're being deceived. This is Christ. Be not deceived. Which one are you looking for? The blessed hope? The catching away of the body of Christ with the life that you're living? Or are you getting distracted by the worldliness, the lust of the flesh and the world and worldliness, and you're getting into acting like the lost world where they're looking for the man of sin?